theme for this morning, the title for today's talk is How to Be Secure in an Unsecure World. Not an insecure world, but, <laughs> but in a world that feels unsecure. Everywhere we look out around us, there are things that look unsecure and can cause us to feel insecure, whether it's political or environmental or social or, you know, young boys trapped in Thailand. I mean, there's just everything, families being separated from each other. There's so much going on in our world that's, I don't know, scary? Would that be the right word? That's scary. And we can feel very unsecure in all of these things that are going on around us in the big picture. But let's even bring it into the closer picture of our own lives. There may be things going on in our own lives that feel scary. Maybe there are um, unsecure situations in our finances or in our health or in our job or in a relationship. Or maybe there's just a general feeling of unsecurity and how do I do no life now that it has completely changed because life can in on a dime completely change we have a beautiful amazing teaching in our science of mind principles it's it's an it's an incredible teaching based on universal truths but I have to tell you something it doesn't promise something it doesn't promise that we won't ever have something that causes us to feel unsecure. It doesn't promise that life won't turn on a dime. It doesn't promise that things won't happen that we don't like, expect, or want to have happen. And we're all living that right now as a spiritual community. I'm living it personally as our beloved Reverend Lonnie, my husband of almost, so here I go again, just breathe with me. We have tissue, and that's why we have stock and tissue. Um, <laughs> you know, who passed away a month and a half ago. Not something that any of us wanted. I sure didn't want that, I'll tell you that. But he did anyway. So these teachings don't promise that stuff won't happen. That's life. That is this human journey that we're on. It's just part of it. But what they do promise us, what they do give us, is a roadmap, a series of tools to navigate, to navigate and to, in fact, continue to feel secure, even in a world that shakes and rocks and rolls and becomes, at times, something that we don't want, we didn't expect, and we don't like. Today, we're going to talk about how do we get there. And we're going to use the book that we're using this whole month. It's called Through God's Eyes. And I was going to be giving talks around this book last month, but then things changed, and so I wasn't even here. I decided to go ahead and use this theme this month and use this book because it's even more important now, I think, than it was last month. And we're dedicating, I am in my heart, dedicating this whole month and everything we talk about to our beloved Lonnie in his honor and his memory. So this month's lawn is for you. Okay, breathe. <laughs> Reverend Sherry is in my head, breathe. Take a deep <laughs> breath. So this book offers some amazing inspiration with quote after quote after quote after quote. Those of you who like quotes, this is a book for you of s quotes from spiritual masters, from authors, from teachers, from uh, celebrities, from business leaders, from philosophers. Just beautiful, beautiful teachings all with a consistent message. Exactly consistent with our science of mind teachings because truth is truth. I haven't found a religious scientist yet in there, so although I haven't read the whole thing yet, but if I don't find one, I'm going to have to write the author and send them a few of my quotes. How's that? And then, <laughs> and then in the next in the next edition of it, in the next edition of it, I we we can be represented in there. I'd like that. <laughs> so today is coming from chapter seven, and chapter seven, the title of it, I think, lays out where we're going to go today. I really could just say this and then say go home, but I have a few more things I want to talk about ar around it. But the title of chapter 7 is this, External Security is an Illusion. Hmm. What? E uh -huh. External security is an illusion because things out here in the world may in this moment feel fine and great and safe and in the next moment may not. 
That's everything I was just talking about. So external security is an illusion. I want to give you a story. I want to share with you a story that um, is going to kind of set the tone for our work together today. And it's a story of the famous Italian violinist Nicola, Nicola, there you go, I got to get the emphasis right, Nicola, 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 like Ricola, Nicola Paganini. Remember, yeah, Paganini, we all, we've probably heard of him. So he was this famous, 200 years ago, two centuries ago almost, famous Italian violinist. And he was very popular, and he would travel and do concerts. And so he was coming to a town that loved him, and they were so excited for him to be there. And they, the place was sold out. Tickets were completely sold out. It was standing room only, in fact, for this event, this one-night concert. The night arrives. People are there. They're crazy excited to hear him. He walks out on the stage and he gets this roaring standing ovation before he does anything, before he plays one note, before he plucks one string. The crowd is standing and applauding him. So he gets them seated, and they finally they sit down. And he bends down to pick up his, his violin. Now, his violin is a very, very, very special violin. It's very special because it is the, I said in first service, Cadillac of violins. And then we had a debate in first service about, like, what is the epitome of cars? <laughs> and, and actually, one, one ca car came, what would you say, the epitome of a car is what? Okay, well, you're right in line with first service. Yep, Rolls Royce. Okay, so it was the Rolls Royce of violins, a Stradivarius. And so not only does it start out being a Rolls Royce of violins, he has hand-strung it himself. And not only is it his performance violin. It is his practice violin. So to say that he and the violin have a sacred and holy relationship would not be a, an overstatement. So he picks up his violin only to see, much to his dismay, that it is not his <laughs> violin. It's some other violin. And so he says to the audience, excuse me, there has been a mistake. I'll be right back. And he walks backstage carrying this thing that is not his violin. And he sees the stage manager, the director, the theater director standing there shaking in his boots. And the theater director said, oh, I am so, I mean, you know, I think he wanted to try, he was trying to get this over on him and maybe he thought Paganini wouldn't notice. That's not going to happen. He said, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened, but clearly your violin got stolen before the show began before your performance began. And so we combed a two block radius to try to find another violin and this was what we came up with. This is the best we could find. Now just pause the story for a moment. Let's put it on hold for just a moment. I want you to put yourself in that situation or maybe think of a, sim a situation where you've kind of had the rug pulled out from under you. You've had your security blanket, <laughs> that could be, right, taken away. Whoa, how do we respond? This is awful. This is terrible. I can't go on. This is horrible. I'm never going to be able to do what I'm supposed to do, right? We could think that. He might have done that. He could have said, call the authorities, call the police. I've been robbed. This is terrible. I, I'm unwilling or even maybe I'm unable to continue this concert, to have it refund the tickets. I'm going home. He could have done that. We might have done that, possibly. But he didn't do any of that. He didn't do any of that. Instead, he took the violin, came back out on stage, held it up to the audience and said, what I'm going to give you tonight is an opportunity to witness that the music is not in the violin. The music is not in the violin. The music is in him. Take away the external. Our security is not found in the external. Our security is found in the within. I love this statement from Through God's Eyes that says, security is not in having things, it's in handling things. Security is not in having things, it is in handling things. So if our, the transition of our beloved Lonnie 
has shown us anything, and it's shown us a lot, but it has shown us that life can throw us a curveball. How we handle it is what makes all the difference. I love this quote. Lots of quotes from this book because that's what it's a book of quotes, so I'm going to give you lots of them. What we often seek in the name of security is the avoidance of the unexpected, the assurance of the known over the unknown, the guarantee of certainty. Hmm. But we just don't get any of that. An author, Marilyn Ferguson, wrote, it's not so much that we're afraid of change or so in love with the old ways, although sometimes we are quite in love with the old ways, but it's, the place, but it's that place in between that we fear. It's like being between trapezes. It's Linus when his blanket is in the dryer. <laughs> There's nothing to hold on to. Paganini had nothing to hold on to, <laughs> except he did. He had the music within him to hold on to, and that was enough. In fact, that was more than enough. Because by his words, not by the audience's assessment, although they gave him a roaring standing ovation at the end of that concert that lasted forever, but by his own words, that was the finest concert he gave in his entire life. The finest. Because he found the music in him. So I want to offer you this morning a thought <laughs> on how do we find security? How do we feel secure when the world rock, rocks and rolls around us? And I thought of there's lots of places we could go, and there are lots of ideas in this book. There's a bunch of ideas. I could do a whole month on just this one chapter because of all the different ideas, the different threads. But I actually pulled a thread that's not even from the book because as I was just in it all and prayerful about it, I went, oh, no, I know exactly where we're going to go. I want to give you seven words. And this, there are seven words that will support us in staying secure, even regardless of what's going on around there. And I love the seven. I love the idea of seven. I love the metaphysics behind the number seven. I have taught for years that seven represents completion. You know, God created the earth in six days, and on the seventh, she did what? She rested, right? <laughs> he, she, whichever. There's really, I wish there'd be a pronoun other than it. I don't like it, you know, but God rested on the seventh day. Complete seven is the number of completion. But I did a little research because I wanted to see just what else there might be out there about seven. And of course, anything you find on the internet is true, right? Of course, it's all true. Whatever you find there, it's completely true, we know. But I did find this that I found fascinating. It's a perspective on the number seven. And it said that back as far back as ancient Egypt, notably re in religious settings, buildings or edifices were built respecting the proportions of three numbers. And the three numbers are, first of all, the number three, which symbolizes equilibrium, the trinity, and that is, is it confers spiritual or divine characteristics. The second number that is often found in sacred buildings is that's, uh, that's um, represented and, and structurally in there is the number four. And the number four represents, is symbolic of the material world. And the third one is the number seven, which are those two numbers added together, representing the balance between the divine and the earthly, heaven and material. And it said, it infers, it refers to completeness and the aspect of things well done. So I love the idea of seven. And seven being this idea of completeness and things being well done. So our idea this morning is seven words. And those seven words that will help us, that will summarize how do we stay secure in a world that feels very unsecure, whether it's that world out there or our personal world, it's this. Are you ready? Yes. Good. Three of you are ready. I love that. <laughs> right. <laughs> give us, a, she says, give us a, okay. Are you ready? As our, as a divine do-over, yes, as our form, as our very first choir director, Regina Rose, amazing, gorgeous light in this world, uh, used to say to us as, as the choir, 
I tried singing in the choir for a while. She said, I want you to blow their dresses up, right? So, <laughs> so you just blew my dress up, but not really. All right, so <laughs> here are the seven words. Anchor into who and whose you are. Yeah, you've heard that before. That's nothing new, but it's important, critically important to remember. Anchor into who and whose you are. Author of A Wrinkle in Time, Madeline Lingle said, it's a good thing to have all the props pulled out from under us occasionally. It gives us some sense of what is rock under our feet and what is sand. Referring, I'm quite sure, to Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 24, where he speaks to the masses. He's giving lots of wisdom and advice in this period of time. And he says to them, those who hear my words but do not heed them are like the man who builds his home on sand. And then the rains come, the floods come, the winds come, and his home is wiped out. But the one who hears my words and heeds them is like the man who builds his house on rock, solid rock. And then when the winds come, the floods come, the rains come, his house stands firm. We stand firm. We stand on the rock when we anchor into who and whose we are. So even without the floods, the rains, the winds, even without that coming in this in unsecure world, just living life full out is risky, isn't it? I mean, that's not a secure deal. Now, maybe if you just want to live in your little house and just sit there and not do anything, maybe there's not a lot of risk to that, although there is risk even in that. You atrophy. <laughs> that's a big risk. <laughs> All right. But if you want to be out there in the, in the world and sharing your gifts, being the change that Cerise sang about, wrote about, giving of who you are, living life fully, it's risky business. Not to be confused with the movie, although that's kind of a fun little. It's, ri <laughs> it's risky business. It's risky, and I love this statement from historian and author Kenneth Davis who said, any life truly lived is a risky business. And if one puts up too many fences against the risk, mm -hmm, think about that, too many fences against the risk, one ends by shutting out life itself. I was having a conversation a week and a half ago or so with Rochelle McCreary. You may recognize that last name. She's Reverend Sherry's daughter. Where Cheryl was here, her mother was in a meeting, she was waiting for her, and I popped in and went into the kitchen and sat down and had a conversation with Rochelle. And Rochelle's a, a, the, the head of the practitioner group over at our sister church, New Vision Center for Spiritual Living, and she's teaching a class right now that she created called Calling in the Beloved. And it's about calling in your intimate partner. And she said, Michelle, I have to tell you, the class is going on right now, she said, I have to tell you, we've had a number of conversations over the last few weeks about you and Lonnie. She said, and there's been questioning among the students about, wow, it's risky to love so deeply. That's really risky because look at how painful this is now, how hard this is for Michelle, for all of us who loved him, but particularly Michelle. I mean, it kind of sucks. I can say that in church, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's my church. I can say what I want. <laughs> right. <laughs> because the fact, the fact is, it does really, really suck. It, it's just at times it's awful. It's just awful. It's horrible. And so she said, my students are saying, is it worth it? I don't know, it's, maybe it's not worth it. Maybe it's just, maybe I just, I'm okay by myself. I don't need to call in a beloved. And I looked at her and I just said, please go back to your class. 
and tell them, I said, promise me you will say to them, I said, it is worth every little bit, every big bit of risk. It is worth every minute of the risk. I would not trade one second of the life he and I had together. Even the last month, which was really hard and really sucked. <laughs> Even that last day, which was hideously hard and sucky and beautiful and gorgeous and all of those things. I wouldn't trade a minute of it to alleviate some of the pain that I feel now and the grief that I have and that we all have. I, I personally wouldn't trade one minute. Is it worth the risk to live and love full out? Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> and do we have any guarantee about anything? No, we don't. And it's worth the risk anyway. So take a deep breath. Channeling Reverend Sherry, take a deep breath. Our security, when our world is rocked, falls in remembering who and whose we are. And in remembering my favorite quote, favorite, favorite quote from a man who's considered the father of a new thought. Okay, here's a test, students. Who's considered the father of a new thought? With more, with more secure, with, come on, say that like you know, you know, you know it. Thank you. Ralph Waldo Emerson is considered the father of new thought. He said, and I love this, <coughs> excuse me, what lies behind us and what lies before us are small matters compared to what lies within us. What lies within us? Strength, courage, ability. That's what lies within us because God resides within us, lies within us. So I like that as a, an affirmative personal statement. So we're going to tweak Ralph a bit and say what lies behind me and what lies before me are small matters compared to what lies inside or within me. And now, of course, you know where this is going. I don't want this just to be my affirmation. I want it to be all of ours. So I'm going to chunk it up invite you to say it after me. What lies behind me, what lies before me, are small matters compared to what lies within me. Now, I love, I have some of you really well trained. I love it. And some of you are going, why are these people holding their hands up? Well, I'll tell you. Yeah, it's the power stance. There's great scientific research that says the way we move our body and hold our body impacts how we feel and how we ex receive things and the message that we give out. And the most powerful stance, according to, what's her first name? Putty is her last name. I've forgotten her first name. But she's the social scientist. She's got a couple of YouTube um, TED Talks. They're amazing. She said the power stance is standing up mm -hmm, with arms out. So come on, let's go. Come on. Just don't hit anybody. That's all I ask. Don't whack somebody. All right, so we're going to do this again. Repeat after me. What lies behind me? What lies behind me? Ooh, yeah, I'll blow my skirt up. What lies, what lies before me? Are small matters compared to what lies within me? Amen? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Remember who you are, and then remember whose you are. Remember that there is a presence and a power of love that if we were going to put a human quality to it, which we know, of course, it is not human and way bigger than any human quality, but we need to do that for our minds to wrap around, loves us beyond any kind of love we have ever felt here in this earthly plane. There is a power and a presence that cares for us and loves us beyond all imagining. And from through God's eyes, it says, security is not the absence of danger, but the presence of God no matter what the danger. Security is not the absence of danger, 
but the presence of God. Now, what we know is God is always present, but a conscious, in our minds, presence of God, right in the middle of it. So we can feel and be secure in an unsecure world when we remember who we are and that we are courage and that we are strength and that we are ability to face whatever comes our way. To face whatever comes our way. We have it in us. We might not know we have it in us until it is called upon. I didn't know. I had it in me. I told you the first Sunday I came back that my imagining about what this would be like when Lonnie passed, my imagining of it was actually worse than the actual experience of it. Because in my imagining, I wasn't calling upon what I have within me. My brain was just really busy awfulizing how horrible that was going to be. But when it actually happened, I called within, not even consciously, because I've spent 30 years in spiritual practice, <laughs> called upon what's in me. And it's an anchoring in knowing who I am. Courageous, strong, able, loved. And it's also a calling upon knowing whose I am. Loved beyond measure. Not just in this tangible world. Yes, I am that too and I'm blessed for that. But in the intangible world by the divine. Anchor into who and whose you are. That's how we do it. I want to leave you with a compilation, a mashup. Ah, it's a mashup, actually. <laughs> I like that. It's not a song, but it's a mashup of Bible verses, actually. Put in a little bit more modern language but and pull from Old Testament, New Testament, mixed around, not in any chronological order. But it's called an intimate message from God to you. And it's about how much God loves us. And I'm not going to read the, the, the citations because that will just mess up the flow of this thing. If you're interested in knowing where these verses are, I'm happy to share with you because I have them all. But I just wanna, I want you to receive this. So I invite you to close your eyes. I want you to receive this as a message, an intimate message from God directly to you. So breathe deeply. Close your eyes if that feels comfortable. And listen to this message. Because these words remind you of who you are. And they definitely remind you of whose you are. <coughs> you may not know me, but I know everything about you. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered, for you were made in my image. In me, you live and move and have your being. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. <laughs> you were not a mistake. For all your days are written in my book. I knit you together in your mother's womb. And I brought you forth on the day you were born. Now I have been mis misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant. I am not angry. Rather, I am the complete expression of love. It is my desire to lavish my love on you simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand. For I am your provider and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been fulfilled with hope. Because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sand on the seashore. 
and I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you, for you are my treasure. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul. And I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart, for it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine, for I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are brokenhearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I carry you close to my heart. Keep these words in mind, my friends, and they will support you in anchoring on the rock, on anchoring in the knowing of who and whose you are.